This is our 10 year anniversary. You're gonna hear that over and over again. We're really celebrating. We have lots of swag this year to celebrate the 10 year anniversary. And the folks who are coming up next were here 10 years ago with us when we started. And 10 years went by really quickly and they wanted to take this opportunity now that we're 10 years in to remind us of all the progress that we really have made. I think some of the messages you've heard, heard here so far are about all the work that's left to do, and that is 100% what we are here to keep moving forward, to not look in the rearview mirror. But it's really important to contextualize these things in the ways that things have changed. Um, and they've done this in a really creative, beautiful way. And I'm excited to welcome to the stage uh, the folks from Halloran Philanthropies, Tony Carr and Audrey Sellian, and they're accompanied by the Music Action Lab. It's great to be here. We are joined today with the awesome musicians from the Music Action Lab in San Francisco, founded by Drew Foxman. Audrey and I are here today to talk about human well-being. We are excited to share with you some of the major findings captured in our recent landmark book entitled The Pursuit of Human Well-Being, The Untold History. The book is a major global publication and is a tribute to the vision of Harry Halloran and his commitment to build the world we all want. So our journey started many years ago, just about the time that uh, SOCAP was founded 10 years ago. Our focus was to trace the history of human well-being, to learn from the data we collected if the world was getting better or getting worse. History shapes the present. We moved beyond the public square in our research to document what was really happening within all countries in the world in health, education, poverty, and happiness. We found, to our surprise, that there were exciting reasons to be cheerful and optimistic. People have risen out of poverty at amazing rates. Child mortality has plummeted. Standards of literacy, sanitation, and life expectancy have never been higher. And we are living in history's most peaceful era. We found dramatic advances in well-being in all regions of the world. We found strong international support among countries for well-being. Countries like Africa, Asia, or continents like Africa, Asia, and Latin America experienced significant well-being improvements. Progress was due in large part to globalization and foreign aid, which fostered partnerships in business, government, and philanthropy. Now, anyone paying attention to the media today is likely to feel that the world is falling apart and the only attitude that really makes sense is profound pessimism. I have a different view. I think the world is far from falling apart. In fact, it has never been better, more prosperous, safe, or just. The pursuit of human well-being is the story that must be told about the history of human progress 
over time, progress we can all be proud of. The good news is life really is getting better. Well-being is about having a good condition of life, characterized by health, happiness, and prosperity. It's a combination of feeling good and having meaningful relationships and accomplishments. Human well-being is a process of enlarging people's spectrum of choice, the most critical choice being to live a long and healthy life, to be educated and to have access to the resources needed for a decent standard of living. The notion of the good life has existed since the times of ancient Greece. It involves being well off, being fed, clothed, sheltered, educated, and healthy. It also means being honest, courageous, just, generous, compassionate, and hospitable. The good life is a virtuous life. What we've found is that humans have an inexorable, determined obsession with improving their lot. We mostly work towards higher collective standards of life on this planet. This is a unique characteristic of being human. Today we are collectively in a state of health and well-being that has never before existed for large masses of people. For most of us, we have on average eight decades of life within which to pursue our interests. We do so in a more disease-free state than ever previously existed. For those of us struggling with disabilities, we use an array of tools of every describable type to help us. We travel the planet in large numbers and at speeds never previously attained anywhere. We're healthier, better educated on average than the people who walked our cities living just a generation ago. We're also growing increasingly aware that the way we ask our questions matters. As a good friend once told Tony and I, words make worlds, and indeed they do. How we think affects the questions we ask and what we see. Our observations matter. There are two ways to see this world from a perspective of abundance or one of scarcity. Is the glass half empty or is it full? Are we less poor or are we rich? Are we less illiterate or can we read? Are we less sick or are we well? The language we use affects how we think and indeed everything around us. Life expectancy provides a good initial barometer of human well-being. This indicator not only gives us information about the average years a person is expected to live, it also relates to the condition of the person's health during their life, their access to basic health services. Today, two things are true. There's a continuing high rate of child fertility combined with a high rate of population aging. The dramatic increase in life expectancy during the 20th century ranks as one of the world's greatest accomplishments. Life expectancy rose to 71.5 years an increase of almost 20 years since 1960. Life expectancy was 31 years in 1900. In Nigeria, South Africa, and Tanzania, the length of life has increased by 50%. The changes we see today in global health would have been unimaginable uh, amongst our ancestors. Their health conditions were so bad that many children died before the age of five. Most babies born in 1900 did not live past the age of 50. Infant and child mortality, which have posed major threats to child survival worldwide, are now at historically low levels, down over 90% since 1990. Over the last 45 years, infant mortality declined 58%. Child mortality, 62%. Maternal mortality declined 27%. There were 11 million fewer child deaths in 2012 than in 1970. Vaccinations against crippling childhood diseases now reach nearly already 80% of the world's infants and children. Already 17 years ago, average child deaths due to AIDS had declined from 40% to 12. We've seen nearly 50% reductions in malaria mortality rates in Africa. 
There's been an 88% drop in measles-related deaths. In 40 countries in Africa, at least 25% reductions in child mortality have been achieved since 1990, while in Eastern Asia, maternal mortality rates have fallen by 65%. In education, it's a cornerstone that advances individual and community well-being. None of the improvements in well-being would be possible without the expansion and access to knowledge. Governments today are now investing more resources than ever to educate their citizens. Enrollment in primary education has become almost universal. Secondary education reached 74% in 2012. And great progress has been achieved in the enrollment of women and girls. Education of women is the best way to save the environment and indeed is a well-documented major driver of economic productivity. One of the most remarkable results in education is the progress in adult literacy. Adult literacy reached over 85% globally in 2012. The literacy rate in 1900 was about 20%. It's now become the norm in our world. In Africa, the continent has seen net primary enrollment rates increasing to 77% by 2012. Let's look at poverty. Eradicating poverty in all its ugliness is the greatest challenge of our time. When people anywhere are desperate, people everywhere are at risk. Martin Luther King tells us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 40% of the world lived in poverty in 1990. 25 years later, poverty dropped to 10% in the world. Imagine. Poverty was reduced by 1 billion people in 25 years. A remarkable achievement. Poverty reduction was driven primarily by economic and social progress of China, India, and Southeast Asia. If you go to the World Bank's overview of China, you'll find a striking comment, and I quote, since initiating market reforms in 1978, China has lifted more than 800 million people out of poverty. Imagine. China has lifted a significant, really China is to be applauded for being the world hero in poverty reduction. The reduction of poverty is one of the world's greatest humanitarian achievements. It never would have happened without the commitment and cooperation of nations working together with the United Nations. Progress is particularly remarkable when you consider that the world population has doubled since 1960. Sub-Saharan Africa, the cradle of humankind, struggles with poverty. In 2000, The Economist presented Africa to the world as the hopeless continent. Ten years later, in a complete turnaround, the Economist featured Africa as Africa rising. This positive narrative speaks to economic growth, educational accomplishments, and agricultural innovations. Sub-Saharan Africa, despite all its challenges, has made great gains in well-being and is indeed on the rise. Foreign aid programs have helped countries make enormous progress. Disease and poverty projects are the clearest examples of opportunities designed to alleviate human misery. After a generation of great progress, the world's commitment to the poor is currently under attack. Government support is more uncertain now than at any time in recent years. This is a grave concern. In 2015, the United Nations adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. The most important goal of all is no poverty. Calls on us, this goal calls on us to work together 
to end poverty by 2030. The goal is to eradicate, not merely to reduce. This goal represents a major leap forward among nations so that no one is left behind. We are a long way from eradicating poverty and leaving no one behind. Someday, when poverty is gone, according to Mohammed Yunus, we'll need to build poverty museums to display its horrors to future generations. They'll wonder why poverty continued so long in human society, how few people could live in such luxury while billions dwelt in misery and deprivation. The media struggles to tell the story of what's really happening. Good news about poverty is hard to spot because good news is often overlooked. The best headline I've seen for poverty is, poverty fell yesterday by 137,000 people. And it fell every day by 137,000 people for the past 25 years. To me, it is a clear and indisputable fact that investment in well-being saves lives and frees up human potential. And that generosity represented here, generosity is one of the most powerful exports that we have to achieve well-being in the world. Happiness and life satisfaction are among the most important indicators of well-being. International organizations like Gallup and the World Values Survey measure how satisfied we are with our lives daily. The biggest gains in life satisfaction are found among African countries. This is likely related to access to energy, health, education, and infrastructure services. A larger share of the world's population need no longer depend on a single light bulb or candle to light their homes after dark because even low-income urban dwellers in many places are now beginning to have multiple outlets for receiving and using electricity. And if they don't yet, there's probably a social entrepreneur out there working on it. Slowly, more of the world's women are able to vote and participate more fully as members of government nearly everywhere in the world. According to the Gallup World Happiness Report, 10 of the top 11 happiest countries in the world are in Latin America. Latin Americans are known for their warm interpersonal relations, a commitment to family, and relative disregard for materialistic values. These cultural characteristics play a significant role in explaining their sense of well-being and happiness. Another major measure of happiness is how often a nation smiles, and again, Latin America comes out smiling the best among regions. So we are closing with a beautiful poem by Maya Angelou, a poem that inspires and gives hope for the future. A brave and startling truth. We, this people, on a small and lonely planet, traveling through casual space, past aloof stars, across the wave and different suns, to a destination where all signs tell us it is possible an imperative that we learn, a brave and startling truth. When we come to it, to the day of peacemaking, when we release our fingers from fists of hostility and allow the pure air to cool our palms. When we come to it, when the curtain falls on the minstrel show of hate and faces sooted with scorn are scrubbed clean. When we come to it, when we let the rifles fall from our shoulders and children dress their dolls in flags of truce. When landmines of death have been removed and the aged can walk into evenings of peace. When religious ritual is not perfumed by the incense of burning flesh and childhood dreams are not kicked awake by nightmares of abuse, we, this people, on this small and drifting planet, whose hands can strike with such abandon that, in a twinkling, life is sapped from the living, yet those same hands can touch with such healing, irresistible tenderness, that the haughty neck is happy to bow, and the proud back is glad to bend, 
out of such chaos, of such contradiction, we learn that we are neither devils nor divines. When we come to it, we, this people, on this wayward floating body, created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and every woman can live freely without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible, we are the miraculous, the true wonder of this world. That is when and only when we come to it. The progress of human well-being is a global success story. We are the beneficiaries of a healthier, richer, and better educated world. The dramatic improvements captured in the pursuit of human well-being must be shared widely to continue expanding the growth of humanity. Just imagine what can be accomplished in the next hundred years. Thank you very much. That's great. How about that music? How about that presentation? How are y'all doing tonight? My name is Drew Foxman, and I'm the founder of a global so social justice accelerator for musicians from around the world. Um, the folks that you saw on stage are part of our, our 2017 cohort, and we have artists participating from Armenia, Nicaragua, Kosovo, Tanzania, Kenya, Japan, and, the, and here in the U.S., um, and we're super happy just to be a part of celebrating 10 years of SOCAP and to collaborate with Halloran. And when we think about what does this collective community look like in 10 years, we see a place where musicians are just as big a part of the narrative and the part of the change that we all want to see. So we're about to go play and join, help celebrate SOCAP out here in the main room. So with that, let's help us, uh, let's, let's help celebrate 10 years of SOCAP and another 10 years of great work. Thanks.